as we all know, there were Iron Age burials treated with what we tend to see as respect, laid to rest with a wealth of objects, then covered by mounds, which ensured the intact survival of the dead. And you know, in a sort of common idea today, we would see that as meaning that there was long recognition of their social agency. Against this, however, there were other transgressive bodies, which, although sometimes equally famous today, were dealt with after death in ways which I argue here sought to drain them of agency. <coughs> One of the most intriguing features of the individuals who became bog bodies in the Iron Age is the surprisingly frequent evidence for impairment. Uh, in this paper I aim to distinguish um, impairment from disability. So when I'm talking about disability, I'm talking about the way that society uh, treats people as when I'm talking about physical conditions, uh, I'm using the term impairment later on. For example, the roughly 16-year-old Uda, probably girl, although that has been debated, um, from the Netherlands, had a curvature of the spine and would probably have walked with a twisted right foot. On the other hand, um, observations suggested that she had well cared for toenails and the condition of the soles of her feet suggested that she wore good quality shoes. <coughs> Again from the Netherlands, we have Zvelu woman. Uh, oops, sorry, I've jumped on this one. Yes, again, we have Zvelu woman down in the bottom right there, um, aged about 35, who had exceptionally short arms, short and average legs, especially on the left side of the body, and curved bones in the feet. Then from Germany, we have Kehausen boy, uh, who had apparently an infection in the socket at the top of his right femur, resulting in, in, a, in an inability to walk without assistance. In death, he was bound in an elaborate manner. Um, so he had cloth running round his neck, uh, down his back, and then binding his hands together. Underneath, once the cloth was removed, it could be seen that he had multiple stab wounds to his throat. Now, these visible impairments could be thought to render these people as disabled, but such a marginal position, sometimes argued to be representing people who were thought to be touched by the gods, can be one of both isolation and power. Sometimes this power may have been seen as benign power, as suggested by this sculpture from central France, from the site of Pauvrelet, on which a muse musician is depicted with an extra finger on the right hand. He's shown as naked, apart from a talk round the neck. Talks elsewhere in sculptural terms in Iron Age Europe uh, being a sign of either high status or closeness to the gods. Perhaps here what we're seeing, therefore, is a case of musical ability being believed to be the result of impairment, so in a sense the opposite of disability. Certainly in much medieval Celtic and Old Norse literature, it's quite clear that the loss of a faculty of speech, hearing or sight, or sometimes locomotion, and that we come back to Wayland there, is associated with the gaining of otherworldly abilities in a kind of trade-off. This may relate to communication with the other world, so a kind of shamanism, um, if seen positively, or a kind of witchcraft or sorcery, if seen negatively, or the gaining of abilities in poetry, famously Homer said to be blind, for example, or wisdom. In some cases, it's been argued that visible differences resulted in exceptional examples of honoured burial. The most well-known case being the Princess of Vix from early Iron Age Eastern France. 
here we have famous burial, um, extremely elaborate burial of a woman laid out on a wagon, uh, a wagon which has been dismantled with the wheels up against the side of the chamber, the enormous cauldron on the other side of the chamber uh, next to um, a large uh, drinking, sorry, a large pouring vessel. Uh, the cauldron estimated to contain several thousand litres of wine, potentially. Also significant uh, is that the chamber meant that the body and the various objects inside it were protected for at least some time after death, and then the whole thing covered by a large mound, and that's uh, this mound here, the princely, princess's tomb as it's labelled. Um, it's below one of these uh, large princely centres on the hill there in the middle of the um, map and also close to what's marked on the plan as a sanctuary um, shown here, open towards the hill with a statue of a woman found in the ditch. Um, that statue of a woman shown, uh, shows her wearing a talk. Other ritual elements nearby are a shrine uh, that is at the spring, which forms the source of the River Seine, and the river itself, which has produced several figurines with clearly indicated pathologies and also what appear to be examples of intersex individuals. Now, the most remarkable of these grave goods uh, found with the so-called princess is this, the talk. Uh, it's a unique example and particularly interesting because of the use as a decorative motif of winged horses, so we come back to flight again, and terminals which have been argued to resemble poppy seeds. And this has been interpreted in terms of transport to another world by magical means. The Vix woman, it's also been argued, um, was physically different. Her skull and neck were asymmetrical, suggesting that anomalous growth had caused the left side of her face to be twisted in a case of what's called wry neck, a disorder that often occurs in conjunction with a displaced hip, as was the case here. Both of these conditions can relate to a breech birth, in which case it was possible that uh, this woman would have been seen as visibly different for her whole life. But as Chris Knussel argued, rather than being seen as disabilities, it may be that the physical appearance of the princess played a part in her unique status and preeminence. We have other examples where physical difference um, does not seem to have been seen as a negative. At the site of Munzing and Rhine in Switzerland, uh, the large Latin period, so that's later Iron Age um, cemetery, contains several individuals with asymmetrical skulls. And this has been interpreted as a result of a small uh, gene pool. The burials are well provided, including one of a small number of weapon burials from the site and grave goods shown here. In this case, it's therefore been suggested that the visible difference was not a disability, but a mark of distinction. We have other more ambivalent cases. In Switzerland, the views expressed uh, through burial um, at the parking site at Sion are somewhat more uh, ambivalent, as I said. A young man with severely deformed long bones perhaps from a neurological condition present from birth but worsening with age, was, was buried in a cemetery, so they weren't set apart from other people, but was buried with the smallest number of grave goods of any of the burials, so kind of there but not quite there in a sense. Finally, in terms of this group of uh, burial treatment, at the early Iron Age Etruscan site, of Civita de Tarquinia in Italy, excavations have revealed the sacred area of the settlement. At the centre of this sort of area of religious activity was the burial of an eight-year-old uh, child 
with signs of a significant aneurysm, interpreted, perhaps overinterpreted, um, as resulting in epilepsy. The excavators argued that this child's disability, or physical impairment, was not a disability, in a sense, but interpreted by the community as a sacred disease, enabling her or him to communicate with the gods and thus entitling them to high social status and a significant and unusual place of burial. So those are just a few examples where it could be potentially argued that you know, difference was something which enabled you to gain a status that you might not have had otherwise. However, the evidence suggests that fear of the dead was perhaps a more significant emotion. It's been argued for bog bodies that evidence of care suggests that these are, in a sense, normal burials. But I would argue that extraordinary care must be taken in dealing with the potentially malign dead. This may be the background to the treatment of old Crocken Man from Ireland, who'd been tortured before death and burial in a bog. His nipples had been cut off, he'd been stabbed in the ribs, he had a cut on the arm suggesting he tried to defend himself. He was then tortured by having hazel withies passed through one of his arms before he was then buried in the bog. He was then decapitated and cut in half. Similar drastic treatment, treatment seems to have been taken in the case of the burial at Haraldskær in Jutland, identified as the Viking Age Queen Gunhild when the body was discovered in 1835, but actually Middle Iron Age in date. This roughly 50-year-old woman, unusually for a bog body dressed, wearing a cape, skirt and cap, may have been strangled and was then pinned down by stakes uh, through uh, the elbows and the knees and then covered with heavier branches. Um, she's much better treated in death today as she's received a royal burial um, in this large church paid for the, by the king at the time uh, on the under the belief that she was a queen. Um, this fascinating evidence from the bogs of Iron Age Northwest Europe has, however, tended to be considered on its own because of the special burial circumstances rather than being seen in terms of past attitudes to certain kinds of impairment or difference for which we need to look beyond the bogs. In an Iron Age shaft at Leyending near Linz in Austria um, were found the piled up remains of about 15 individuals, mostly men but also women and children. These people appear to have been, been impaled on posts in a wooden structure above the pit, which was then set on fire, with the corpses falling down into the shaft. At least six of the adults had significant joint, joint diseases and malformed teeth, argued to show a close genetic relationship, leading to speculation that this was a visibly different family group who were singled out by this social disability for this cruel death, fear of the different, perhaps. Closer to home, we have the as yet unpublished um, site at Fishmonger's Swallet Cave in Alverston in Gloucestershire, where disarticulated human remains were found from six individuals, including a split femur with cut marks and percussion damage, up top right there, interpreted as possible evidence of cannibalism, which seems to me to be a clear case of denial of agency. Another individual may have suffered from Paget's disease producing a curved spine, and you can see um, this, uh, evidence of impairment bottom right there. Then we have a very unusual in situ partial cremation, carried out not as originally believed by the excavators, uh, of this site in Wiltshire uh, during the Roman period, but actually about 300 BC. This body of an adult male with severe spinal degenerative joint disease and a healed skull injury had been crowned face down between burning timbers, which partially burnt the body, which was then covered over with soil. In Kent, we have this site, Minster, a late Iron Age, thanks, 
cemetery of 11 burials of mature adults, five of whom had healed traumatic injuries, including a man with skull and rib fractures, as well as being exceptionally tall. He was buried prone, face down. Another male had a possible brain tumour. Several individuals had spinal anomalies and stress fractures. And this perhaps appears to be some kind of special marginal burial area. The other kind of transgressively different <coughs> person we can consider is the witch or sorcerer, which could be seen as a voluntary position of marginalisation, but with powerful, albeit often illegitimate, agency. This has been surprisingly little discussed in the European Iron Age, even though witchcraft is mentioned in a number of contemporary Roman historical sources, which records several major witch hunt crazes with thousands of victims. Roman antipathy to alternative religious agency was extreme, but archaeological evidence suggests that the fear of the dead was a significant factor in the Iron Age too, in part generated by fear of the misuse of the dead in the form of their bones to create an unacceptable form of power. Starting with Italy, but not in the Roman world, in southern Italy, uh, these two graves were found next to a religious building. Inside the building there were three contemporary burials covered by massive boulders. The one outside the building had a young man hit over the head, buried prone and held down by a big slab of stone on the back. And these have been interpreted as pinning the dead in place. Some at least of the examples of Iron Age decapitation, of which there are many, could be interpreted in this way, such as the head and vertebrae of a man from a pit in Yorkshire. Um, after removal with a knife, the head was placed face down at the bottom of the pit and speedily covered over. His DNA suggests he was an outsider and thus perhaps an ideal magician. Also in Britain, at Great Horton, in Northamptonshire, a woman was apparently trussed and bound, buried face down in a shallow pit on the edge of a settlement. Although the pit was quite large, she was, as you can see, pressed up against one side of it. The only grave good was this unique lead alloy, or almost unique, I should say, lead alloy torque found round her neck, with the opening at the back rather than the normal front position. The excavator suggested that the lead talk was the best they could do to provide the grave goods for a respectful burial, but for me this seems more plausible as an outcast burial. Then we have pit burials at Hillforts, and of course well known, plenty of examples of these, um, which have been more normalised recently in the literature, but many of which appear to be individuals who are thrown into pits. Um, there's a wide variety of body treatment which we overlook if we try to simply have this one category of pit burial and put everything in that, as it were. We've got examples of binding, crushing, weighting down by blocks of stone. Suitable treatment, I suggest, for a kind of enemy within. At Douissant in France, the incomplete remains of two men, one young, one mature, found in a single pit. The young man had been stabbed to death. Both bodies had been exposed for months before burial and partially scavenged, probably by dogs. Just as striking as the burial of a fat man face down in a di very narrow ditch at Chilly Mazarin in France, he was later disturbed and the head was twisted round, maybe to stop him seeing. In France, again, this grave, thanks. Um, contained the burial of a man whose face had been cut off before burial, therefore perhaps removing the power of their gaze. Finally, what sort of activities might bring about this kind of excessive response? The most likely is attempts to draw on the power of the body by using, or probably in the opinion of most misusing, body parts after death. These could be retrieved and used over long periods. In particular, we see the use of the skull, perhaps for magical purposes, may be particularly efficacious in cases of violent death. Creating amulets from sections of skulls is fairly well known. Less discussed is the use of human bone for tool production. 
Sometimes in weaving, which brings to mind the fates or the norms of Norse mythology, goddesses who could weave people's lives. And therefore raising the idea that people were using human bones for weaving to try to control the future. Whatever the details of Iron Age belief systems, it's highly unlikely that those who are believed to misuse the power inherent through bo in bone through transgressive activities would be tolerated. Instead, they would be dealt with violently and still feared after death, every precaution taken to limit their agency. The most dramatic of the sites potentially con connected with deaths following witchcraft or sorcery accusations comes from Denmark. Fire destroyed this longhouse, hence the red colour, at Nora Tranders, killing not only several cows, sheep and lambs, horses, a pig and a dog, but also two people, and two, ad two adults rather, and two adolescents. The excavator's feeling is this is accidental death, not murder, but the inhabitants could have been prevented from, from leaving the building, and there was no attempt to gather up the remains for any kind of burial. Do we as archaeologists shy away from confronting potential evidence for an archaeology of transgression unless it is neatly packaged up as dark heritage? Thank you.